Well, first of all, Prime Minister, I think really on behalf of all of us, that has been a, not only a very incisive analysis of the challenges facing Singapore, but it's one of the most passionate, I think, uh, expositions we've heard, and we truly take heart from that. In fact, I should let you know that your constant exhortation to procreate has not fallen on deaf ears. Um, <laughs> As of uh, three weeks ago, Claire and I have become a Ye Ye and Nai Nai. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my son and daughter-in-law, when they gave birth, they were given the special SG50 hamper with your personal message on it. They were so thrilled, they framed it up. And don't, don't stop there. <laughs> no, we have a daughter who's also uh, got married, and we're telling her she has to listen to you, sir. We uh. listen to our leadership to procreate. <laughs> Do it for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it wasn't exactly for the SG50 hamper, but, <laughs> but certainly I think uh, it, the, the joys of uh, parenthood and the joys of grandparenthood are certainly uh, something that is really impossible to reproduce. Now, there are lots of questions for you, so I think we'll go straight into it. Um, there's two microphones, just for the sake of the audience, there are two microphones set up. Uh, with the marked one and two. Uh, people who are queued there, you, you would ask your questions. If you have a question to ask, please queue, because with this large audience, it would be impossible for me to identify anyone raising their hand. So if you have a question, uh, please uh, make your way to the microphones. Shall we start first with the first questioner, uh, number one, and then we'll go to number two, and then we'll alternate. So over to you, sir. Right, uh, thank you, Mr. Lee, for your speech. My name is Kenneth Ho, and I'm from SMU. So you mentioned that GDP growth and population growth has been slowing down, but I think that uh, the level of competitiveness has been steadily increasing, and I'm sure most of the students here will agree with me. So my question is, do you think that we have reached an unhealthy level of competitiveness? And if yes, how should we address it? Thank you. I think when you say competitiveness, you're, you mean two different things. Competitiveness meaning competing with one another amongst the students, I think we compete very hard. Competitiveness meaning we are a lot better than people outside there, well, I think we are better, but I'm not sure that we have such a big lead. So we have to work hard. I think students today work very hard. I suspect that you work harder than I used to when I was in school. Um, you do a lot more group projects, and that usually means no sleep. <laughs> and, I mean, Huang Pin was just telling me you've got places where you are allowed to crash out in, in your campus because you're on these projects. And it's an intense experience. I think it depends on the spirit in which you take this. Uh, it's necessary for you to put your all into your studies, but you want to work on this not just as individuals, but as in teams and be able to work together with your friends and your classmates. You compete with each other, but you work together with each other. Uh, I think that some parents in Singapore, probably some students also, if I may, may use a Singapore word, are a bit more kanchong than they need to be, a bit more anxious than they need to be. Uh, you must get into the right school, you must get into the right class, you must get into the right stream. If you don't do that, your life is permanently channeled into the wrong path for the rest of your life. I think that's the wrong attitude. There are many opportunities in life. You try to take them when they, you can, but there's always another chance down the road. And keep on looking forward and working for that one. And I think that way we keep a balance. Thank you, sir. Please. Good evening, uh, Prime Minister Lee. I'm Kenneth Yeo from SMU as well. Um, I have a question regarding economy because... Uh, Sorry, can uh, they turn up the, the mic a little bit? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, speak louder. I, I have a question regarding the economy because uh, Singapore's economy is largely dependent on the foreign uh, economy, as, uh, the global economy as well. So uh, right now, <coughs> according to the assessments of, uh, worldwide, the global economy is pretty uncertain with the great exit from the U, uh, potential exit from the U, uh, EU and the China's um, economy slowdown. And also US uh, being one of the major superpowers, uh, uh, they, they have 
uh, re election. So it's pretty uncertain. So how can students or graduates like us um, uh, exploit these opportunities or overcome these challenges? What are you studying? I'm studying uh, social science. Well, you can do many. You can go to many different careers and professions as a social science graduate, as a general education. But I think that you must expect as you go along to learn new skills as you proceed, because I don't think you have a complete set for you to take you through any career. The world economy will always have its uncertainties. There will be ups and downs, there will be alarms. Some things are up, some things are down. Um, there will always be opportunities even in the midst of a crisis. You take Turkey, for example. It comes to mind because I, was, I visited them last year. And they were working very hard to try and get closer to the Europe, Europeans and enter the EU. Uh, hasn't succeeded, but they were working towards it. But the Europeans went into a crisis. They reoriented their directions. They focused on new markets. They developed their links with Africa, with Latin America. And I think they had a lot of success opening the markets, getting their businesses there, getting a new source of growth. The Australians had the same problem when the global financial crisis came because they were exporting to Europe. Where do you export to? Well, you have to find new markets for your dairy products, for your minerals. They found the Chinese, they developed the, the emerging markets. They promoted new uh, customers. They found a living. Singapore has to be like that too. Singaporeans also have to be like that. And I think that if you are in SMU, the way they are training you, that is what they are trying to make you be able to do. Not to have a ready-made set of skills so you can just plug in and, well, straight away you can work, but to be able to have that spryness in an uncertain situation to judge where you want to go. Have you had spent time overseas as a student? Uh, not as a student, but the last time I went overseas, I, I was with you as well at uh, APEC Bali two years ago. Yeah. Well, you have seen how APEC is. You've met your classmates or your contemporaries who are also participating. Uh, I think they are hungry too. But I think that having met them, you know that uh, you, you, you can do business with them and you are equal with them, at least. So I think there's reason to be confident. Thank you. Please. Um, good, good evening, Mr. Ho, and good evening, Mr. Lee. Thank you for the very insightful and uh, top <coughs> um, lecture today. Uh, I do have a question to ask. Um, I'm not sure how Can you well tell us who you are, please? Yes, by way of introduction, uh, I'm Kimberly Young from SMU, a final year economics student. So I have a question to ask. I'm not sure how well received it is, but one thing I'm sure of is that if I don't ask today, I will have a regret to live on with the rest of my life. No, no, there'll be many more chances, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, sure, thank you, Mr. Lee. So over the weekend, um, the same-sex marriage was legalized in the United States. Effectively, nine citizens redefine marriage on behalf of millions of their peers uh, many of whom were opposed to the idea of same-sex marriage. What is your views on the appropriateness of judges' views overriding properly passed laws? And also, do you think a political or ju judicial solution is better to address such a thorny issue, um, especially for countries like Singapore? Thank you. Well, this is the way the American system works. They have created the Supreme Court and uh, is nine men, and, and the nine men decide important issues. And in this case, it was five to four. So actually, one man decided the issue. <laughs> yeah, but that is their system. Uh, they will not say that they made a decision on the issue. They will say that they interpreted the Constitution in its true sense, and this is what the U.S. Constitution has always meant. I mean, that is the way that... I'm not a law professor, but... I think that's the way they explain their, their legal system. It's how they dis resolve social, political, economic, racial, all kinds of important issues. Congress, the parliament, doesn't have the last word. It goes to the Supreme Court. 
things like abortion, things like uh, uh, racial discrimination, busing, drugs, all sorts of things go to the Supreme Court. It's not our system. In our system, the parliament decides, the executive, through the parliament, takes the lead, legislates, and legislates on behalf of the population. On an issue like LGBT, where there are very strong views in the society, I think the legislature has to act very, very cautiously. Because you can pass the law, but will it be accepted? Will it be respected? Will people feel that it is legitimate? I think that we have to have a good sense of the ground, a good sense of how people feel, and reflect the, va the values and the attitudes of the population rather than try to impose your own on them. Uh, even in America, there are people who feel like that. I mean, there are, there are many, 40% uh, of Americans are opposed to same-sex marriage. And they say, well, you decided this, but I don't like this. I have to accept it, but it's not my preference. I think in Singapore, we have different legislative um, arrangements. I think we have a much more cautious approach towards social issues. I think on LGBT issues, I've stated my position, is one where we move carefully because it depends, it's really a conservative population and we, I think we let the views evolve with time. The population, uh, they, they have to decide collectively rather than the government decide that I'm going to go one way or the other. All so, right, thank you very much. So it, look, it looks like the, um, the issue that you said about identity and the fractured uh, sense of cohesiveness, you mentioned LGBT as being an issue 50 years from now. It looks like it's coming up sooner than no, that. No, I, I don't think the LGBT issue will, will wait 50 years to come up. It's here. But if you want to stay one nation cohesive for 50 years, these are the kinds of issues you must manage without fracturing Absolutely. our society. Absolutely. Please. Good evening, PM Lee. Uh, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, my name is Ashwarya, and I'm from SMU. So uh, I would like to ask you about this issue. You have been bringing up uh, having more children and progression of families. So there was this competitiveness question that c came up, which was between university students. But it definitely goes beyond that. And it is one of the obstacles that um, young couples face because they feel that it's going to put a break in their career progression. So what is your message towards such young couples who may be facing this dilemma if they would like to have more children, but they feel that it's going to bring a pause? Well, I think I have a kind of a split message. <laughs> On the one hand, I fully understand young people wanting to pursue their careers. Whether they're men or women, they want their careers, they've worked hard, they want to become good lawyers, good accountants, good managers, good leaders, or entrepreneurs. So we would like you to do that and yet have kids. <laughs> we would like you to be a super mum, but not everybody can be a super mum. And so we try to make it easier. Easier in terms of childcare, easier in terms of uh, preschool, easier in terms of um, affording it because you've got the baby bonus, easier in terms of uh, employers having the right attitudes, encouraging the, their family, their employees to have kids, to be able to bring their children to, to work, you know, family days, and generally welcoming the family into the workplace and into the whole life of the employee. I think that's one part of it. But the other part of it, which is not perhaps such a welcome message for Singaporeans, is to say, well, we all want everything in life, but we must have a balance in life. And you need to have a balance between wanting to have a family and wanting to have a career. And you have to spend some time on your kids, you have to spend some time bringing them up, looking after them, nurturing them. And it means that time taken is taken off your career. And at the end of the day, when you are, I don't know what is a good end of the day, let's say 70 years old, would you like to look back and say, I've been a super lawyer, or I've 
had a good career and I've also had a good family. And I have children, I have grandchildren, and I'm content. I have lived my life well. And I think that it's very difficult to ask a 20-year-old to imagine what a 70-year-old would like to feel. But I think that if you take that perspective, in other words, uh, if, I, if you use my framework, 10, 25, and 50 years, on a 10-year perspective, you would pursue your career. On a 25-year perspective, you might have one or two kids. On a 50-year perspective, you might decide the kids come first. And I think that is something which we have not come to terms with. If you look at the Scandinavians who have a lot of kids, uh, they are often content to have three quarters of a career. They work hard, but they don't work 12 hours or 18 hours a day. They work, they finish in the evening, 3, 4 o'clock. They, they fetch their kids from childcare. They go home, they spend time with kids. And uh, it's a balance. It's a different kind of society. We are not like that. But it's a balance, and it's, these are choices which we have to make for ourselves. But the Scandinavian countries, PM, have achieved a higher TFR. They also have huge government support and industrial support for long parental leave up to a year uh, or so. They, Do you think Singapore they, employees they, would have... Scandinavians that? throw the kitchen sink at the problem. Mm. It's not just huge parental support, six years or one, six months or one year or longer, but they give you everything. I mean, there are the bonuses, there are um, the child care. Essentially, every kid has a child care place, right. and basically half the mums are employed taking care of the kids of other people's other mums, because a big part of the women are employed working as childcare. But uh, their TFR people. has gone up. Their do TFR is not bad, 1.6, 1.7. Do you think Singapore would ever contemplate anything close to that? Well, if you're prepared to have a GST of 20%, I can imagine <laughs> fu funding that. Goodness, it's up to you. Um, can I ask? I've noticed that uh, SMU students seem to have made the, sort of monopolize all the questions. <laughs> Could I have a show of hands of who is not an SMU student? Because we clearly invited other universities, not SMU students. Okay. Uh, Could I ask the non-SMU students yeah, yeah, on this lady, side yeah. here and then on this side to jump the queue, please, and give you the opportunity to ask because we don't want to monopolize this. Although SMU students are totally enthralled by this lecture, we would want others to have the opportunity. So please go ahead. Um, good evening, PM Lee and other distinguished leaders in the room today. Uh, I'm Kit Man, a sec four student, not from SMU, I'm from River Valley High. And PM Lee, in your speech, you mentioned a lot about the need to increase productivity in Singapore. But a troubling trend to note in the recent decade, especially in countries such as America, is the decoupling of wages and productivity, where people are working harder, they are working more efficiently, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are earning more. And let's be honest, if we are not going to earn more money, um, it's likely that we are not going to bother trying to be more productive. So do you fear that Singapore will two-face this problem in the future and touch wood if it does? How do you think we can combat it? Combat well, it? Yeah. I was going to say, with a question like that, I think she should definitely come to SMU after you finish. <laughs> so. I'm more okay. interested in the sciences, so yeah. <laughs> well, well, studying productivity is a scientific question. <laughs> it's a conundrum. Nobody quite understands why. It may be that the labor market, the unions have lost uh, bargaining power in America. It may be that um, the top bosses have you know, I, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, I pay you $50 million, you pay me 70 and taken a disproportionate share of the profits. It may be because of um, the finance industry uh, growing rapidly, and in the finance industry, the winner takes all is a very strong phenomenon. So the, the economists are not quite sure why it's happening in America. Uh, it could therefore happen in Singapore. We hope it doesn't happen in Singapore. I think if you look at wages in the last decade, Singapore wages have been going up. In fact, our wages have been going up faster than productivity. So, so far, touch wood, so good. We will have to watch this. 
But I would say productivity going up, wages may not. Productivity doesn't go up, wages will not. That's for sure. So you have no choice. You have to become more productive. Then we have more resources. Then there is a chance that our lives can improve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, Prime Minister and Mr. Ho. Yeah, I'm definitely not from SMU. <laughs> uh, although I'm a former student of RV. <laughs> right. So... I'm, my name is Ken. I'm from BH Global, a homegrown uh, mainboard listed marine offshore company. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your very insightful uh, uh, sharing on your view on the, uh, a lot of lo domestic issues. Um, what I'm looking at, uh, something that probably is quite concerning uh, recently is probably at the regional uh, factors, especially the prowess of China. Uh, just want to know a little bit... Sorry, the what of China? Um, the China's uh, actions by way of uh, Sprali Island. Okay. At, mm -hmm. as You're well, talking about South China Sea. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, as well as uh, its recent uh, interest uh, in Kra Canal, mm -hmm. which uh, that portion uh, probably is something that's beyond our domestic control. Mm -hmm. just, just would like to know your view on this. Yeah, few factors. Well, we all in Asia see great opportunities in China's rise. We see uh, it as a benign force and one which can do a lot of good in the world. I think in South China Sea, there are disputes between China and several ASEAN countries, and we think that it's important that these disputes are managed in accordance with international law, and particularly the law of the sea, and managed peacefully and not on the basis that might is right. And we think that it is in China's interest to do this because you can go on might is right, but at some time you get tired and uh, people no longer acknowledge you. And that's something which the Americans have discovered and is the reason why the Americans are welcome in Asia after so many years, since the war. Because it's not just might, but they are welcome. I mean, they give space to other countries uh, there's a chance for you to prosper, to grow. Uh, mind you, sometimes they, they twist your arm too, but it's much less than you might imagine if it were just a power relationship. The Kra Canal is a very interesting question. It's a subject which has been there for many decades. They've talked about it. It has not happened. Uh, in this case, the subject came up. Uh, it, was, it came up from a business, I think from some business source, the Chinese government said they have nothing to do with this. The Thai government, I don't think, has anything to do with this. And the Thai government actually has a view that, or some people in the Thai government have a strong view that if you create a Thai canal, then part of Thailand will become cut off from the other part of Thailand. And that is not necessarily a good thing. So it's something which they are thinking about, which may happen, may not happen. Uh, if it doesn't happen, we are in Singapore with PSA, if it does happen, if PSA is efficient and you save more money going to PSA than you do cutting across the Kra Canal, then I think we have a living. You look at our airport. Changi Airport is further away than uh, Suvana Bum along the air routes from Europe to Hong Kong to the Far East. But Changi is a successful airport, one of the best in the world. Suvanabum makes a living in Bangkok, but it doesn't take away my lunch. I still maintain Changi Airport. It's special. So if PSA can be special, I think we can keep our lunch. Thank, Thank you, you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, are you from SMU? From National Junior College. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Good evening, sir. My name is Kate from NJC, your former school. Very excited to be here today. <coughs> Singapore is an active and key member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that is currently on the way to fruition. Uh, as the US tries to win back a little dominance over Asia, it has highlighted as part of the TPP negotiations that participating countries limit support for state-owned enterprises 
as well as give companies the right to sue the government directly. Now, my question is, how does this play out for Singapore in the long run and our, and our domestic, domestic interests in protecting jobs at home? Thank you. Well, uh, you have studied this in detail, <laughs> yeah. which is as it should be for an NJC student. Thank you. She's uh, coming to SMU now. As an, as <laughs> as an aspiring diplomat, I would love to have the uh, opportunity to study overseas. And you're right. These and are serve Singapore. What you have named are two of the issues which are on the negotiating table. Uh, SOE, state-owned enterprises, and what rules should apply to them. And investor-state dispute settlement. In other words, if there is an issue between the country and the company, can the company take the country to arbitration and not go to the court in that country, which may or may not be completely uh, uh, uninterested in the outcome. Uh, these are issues which we are discussing with the, uh, with the uh, TPP participants. Uh, we have SOEs, which we must make sure get fair treatment. But at the same time, we also want our companies to get good treatment when they go to other countries and to get fair competition compared to SOEs in those countries. So we are on both sides. In fact, our SOEs are different from other people's SOEs. We don't call them SOEs, we call them GLCs, government-linked companies. And there's a very big difference because the government-linked companies, they don't do the government's bidding. They, we have shares in them, but they have proper boards. They, many of them come under Tamase. Tamase appoints a board. The board oversees the company. And we expect the company to operate properly. We don't give them special perks. We don't ask them to do special duties. So if it's DBS, if it's SIA, if it's Keppel, if it's M Corp or Singtel, they are supposed to operate like proper companies. And everybody knows that Singapore GLCs are different from SOEs elsewhere. And I think the Americans know that. And I think in negotiating to protect our position, that's a very important fact, which we hope will be taken into account. I can't, can't tell you what the outcome is because it's not settled, but I'm sure that we will be making sure we are protected. ISDS is another issue like that, investor state dispute settlement. Um, we are, not own, we are not necessarily the ones who are sensitive about investor state dispute settlement because often we are doing business in another country and if our companies run into trouble, you want to be able to have uh, some recourse and you can't always be sure that if you go to the court there, that will solve your problem. So to have ISDS is not necessarily a bad thing and many of our agreements do have ISDS. Uh, but the Europeans have become allergic to this recently particularly the Germans, because of a specific case, I think, with the Americans. And the Americans themselves are also allergic to this. So that's something to be discussed. But don't worry. If you become a diplomat, you will never run out of work solving <laughs> this kind of problem. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, my name is uh, Shaoui from SMU School of Law, and it was a pleasure to attend your lecture today. Uh, I have two questions. The first question relates to uh, your 50-year challenge of uh, identity. Uh, Singaporeans are now more well-traveled, they are cosmopolitan, and you mentioned that our society may split along fault lines, such as uh, LGBT issues and uh, uh, social and political fault lines. So my qu first question is, how does the government engage the special interest groups, such as uh, environment groups or LGBT groups? My second question relates to political renewal, which you mentioned uh, good leadership is key at the end of your lecture. So uh, on many occasions, you mentioned at different forums that uh, attracting talent from the private sector is, has been difficult. So in view of the impending elections, can you give us an update of uh, the success of the People's Action Party in attracting talent from the private wow. sector? Thank you. May I, may I interrupt here that it's not really because I'm not trying to uh, prevent an interesting question from being asked. It's that I have five minutes left. So if I may, because we generally would not like to have to prevent people from asking questions. If I could, you agree, sir, could I ask each of the other people, there's so many of them, could I ask them just to quickly come up to the mic and ask the questions that they I have? I think you can, then, but you have too many. Maybe the next two then. Yes, okay. And then perhaps you could 
<coughs> I'll summarize. You would summarize yes, how yes. you would like to take the questions. Yes. So could I have two more persons from this side, two more from here, ask your questions, and then PM <coughs> will just summarize it and decide how he wants, wishes to, to round off with a final answer. You'll Good evening, uh, Mr. Lee, Mr. Ho. Uh, my name is Ken. I'm from the private sector. I'm a father of two, and I did some volunteer work with uh, uh, problem youth in, uh, uh, from, uh, as a volunteer work. Uh, my question is actually that uh, given that Singaporeans are so, uh, Singaporean youth are getting smaller and smaller numbers, um, and every year we lose uh, uh, our, some of our youth uh, through, uh, through the system, uh, wouldn't it be better for the country if we devote more resources uh, into our education, having more teachers uh, that ha can help to identify uh, problem youth, um, grow them, uh, prevent them from going down the wrong path before something actually happens? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, next person, please. Uh, hi, sir. I'm Ben from Anglo-Chinese School. And I'd like to know if you agree with the notion that solving the Gini coefficient issue or tackling income inequality as a whole would help address each of the issues that you named in your speech, economics, demographics, and identity. And if so, what exactly is the government looking to do to solve this issue? Thank you. Two more from this side. Uh, good evening, uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Lee and Mr. Ho. My question is uh, that just now, Mr. Lee had mentioned that... that sorry, who are you? Uh, sorry, uh, my name is Ma ning -Zhi, and I'm from Serangoon Junior College. And my question is regarding just now you say that uh, you mentioned the importance of technology in improving the productivity. But I feel that uh, utilize by using technology, there will be a loose <coughs> loss of humanity. Hence, I think the sense of humanity has a close relationship with you know, what you have mentioned, such as identity. So how should Singapore find a balance between uh, of using technology? Thank you. Okay. Final question, please. Good evening, PM Lee. My name is Benjamin. I'm from SMU and currently on internship at Apollo Global Management. Uh, I'd like to ask PM where he thinks the concept of graciousness fits onto the national agenda, graciousness as in the value. My perspective is that it facilitates everyday interactions and basically enhances quality of life. So I'd like to ask PM where he thinks it fits onto the national agenda. Thank you. Thank you. PM, it's not easy. You've got a very You've covered the whole <laughs> ground. I need another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say on... On identity, yes, the government has been working hard to engage groups, but the groups also must want to engage not just the government, but each other. And it's not easy between the pro-gay groups and the anti-gay groups. I think the gulf is quite deep. It's not easy to establish a dialogue. But unless people are prepared to have some give and take on many issues, and if each one insists that what I want is my absolute right, I think we are going to fracture and have schisms amongst ourselves. That would be very serious. Uh, we really want a society which is cohesive, and graciousness is an important part of this. Graciousness meaning we, we care about each other, we feel for each other. We are not just in a rat race, but we are in a team together. The Japanese are good at that. The Chinese in China, I think they have changed because under the communist system and then now under the the, the market reforms, the competition is ferocious and each person is out and if you have heard about their higher examinations, cow cow, you will know what kind of a system, what kind of pressures are on the students there and it continues into the workforce. And we want to maintain something which is different where we compete, we compete hard, but at the same time we work together and we feel together. And I think graciousness, therefore, is an important part of this. We may be losing some of this, maybe because of pressures, maybe because we are more focused on small families, we don't have extended families, maybe because uh, we, we are more concerned with materialistic goals. But I think that this is something which we do have to worry about and where the government has some role setting the tone. Um, and that extends also to what Ken said about 
putting resources to troubled youth, which I agree with you, yes, we should do, we are doing it. And that extends also to what Ben says about the Gini coefficient. It's not easy for us to decree a more equal society. These are very deep economic forces, but you do want to build a society where we have a chance for everybody to feel that he is respected and he has a valued place. And you do not want to be a place where if you are rich, you live in one little circle. If you are poor, you are cut out from that circle. We are all Singaporeans together. We all eat at hawker centres from time to time. We all visit the same places. Even when we go on holiday, we don't go on such drastically different places for holiday and we meet each other overseas. And I think that is the right sort of society we want to be. If we can do that, if we can keep that sense, then I think there'll be uh, uh, the social matrix, the basis on which people will say, yes, I want to get married, I want to start a family. One kid is nice, two is better, two are nice, three would be even better. <laughs> and at the same time, be able to find the right balance between that and growing the economy and having, trying for new things. We're making sure that tomorrow will be better. And you can do that, then I think we will have a good 50 years ahead of us. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the lecture. I think I can truly say on behalf of all of us, and particularly even the young, that what we've come to expect from our national leaders and from Mr. Lee is naturally the intellectual rigor of all his analysis. But I think what we've seen beyond that and what the young people in particular in this room and in Singapore are able to truly ascertain is the authenticity of your personality, sir. And the fact that you're so popular and genuinely popular among the young because you engage with them, you're personal with them, you truly share your entire self with them and the passion that you have for this country is so palpable. I think truly for that, we are very grateful. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you again. After this, uh, we will be, Mr. Lee will be adjourning to another room where there are going to be uh, students, particularly prepared, who want to meet up with you. Everyone wants to take a selfie with PM and put it up on their Facebook. And the rest of you will see at another reception which, which Mr. Lee will go to afterwards. So can I ask you all again, on behalf of all of us here, particularly all the people in the young who had so many questions to ask of Mr. Lee, can we thank you, sir, for being who you are? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.